Okay. All right, so um, I've handed back your homework. I've uh, collected homework assignment. I've handed back your exams. The way to the exam key is posted on Blackboard. Your grade will not change by flipping through it magically. We had that kind of skill. We all but you had a Hogwarts instead of the University of Mississippi. So <laughs> the magical, I believe. <laughs> okay. So um, today we're going to finish up the MIPS data path design, and then we're going to start going into what are called the reduced MIPS data path questions, the type of question you'll see on the exam, such as uh, we'll finish the entire data path, but the first question will be something like. Give me a reduced MIPS data path that does add immediate and load word instructions only. So you have to not just memorize the data path, because that would be too be easy for people to have you know, photographic memory. And what you have to do is you actually have to go, all right, do I need this multiplexer? Do I need this memory element? Do I need data memory? Do I need uh, various aspects? You have to make actual design decisions like an engineer would. And then we're going to be going into basic, basics of pipelining. How do we use this concept of pipelining in order to improve performance? And what are the drawbacks of that? We'll get into uh, data hazards and uh, control hazards and structural hazards. So this is the grade distribution of the exam that I just handed back. The median was an 83.5. Uh, uh, 19 people got a 70 or above. Eight got an A, got a B, three got a C, and seven got a D or an F. Um, the keys are posted on Blackboard. I'm sure you've seen them. The key for both the... Uh, Answer key to the exam, as well as the solution to the uh, ex the makeup question. Uh, I gave uh, points, extra points, based on uh, those of you who attempted the problem. Um, and that if for those of you who attempted the problem, you see a plus whatever you got in red on your uh, exam. That's the uh, additional markup. Um, I wanted to point out an interesting th thing that I noticed as a result of uh, signing this. So the median means that half of the students got an 83.5 or above, and half the students got an 83.5 or below. Hey guys, be quiet, please. Look. So of the students who were above the median when I first graded it, 10 of 13 of them attempted the makeup problem, whereas the 13 students who were initially below the median, only two attempted it. So, that, so there's a pattern here. So the, especially if you're one of these people who is below 70, these 187, you know, you got to really buckle down for your final exams. And I'm going to make an educated guess and say that it's not just my class that this is happening in. Now, I've been taking classes with students and we got my PhD and now I've been grading for four years. And, you know, if I see somebody gets an A on the first exam and then gets like a 60 or a 50 on the second exam, you know, that's that's a common pattern of behavior, but one exam does not a student make, right? You can bounce back and get it A or B on the final and still do well in the class, right? So, but at the same time, you know, this is an opportunity for you to bump your grade up and the students who already had the high grade took advantage of it and the students who didn't generally did not. So, take of that from with uh, what you will. Um, so I wanted to talk about something that a little more cheerful other than exam grades and homework grades and all that. Um, something that's going around on the internet today uh, is a little bug in a game called Civilization that was played on the Atari 8-bit uh, back in the day. Um, the general idea of the game Civilization is that they were very proud and they advertised this game on the concept that we are historically accurate and we are um, the, the characters in the video game, you know, they had... Uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Hitler, Mahatma Gandhi, and they said, okay, we, we have an accurate description of these people, and we put them into the game and see uh, how uh, they interact, and the objective is for the player to, quote, build an empire to stand the test of time. And we're going to discuss how the difference in uh, not understanding how code is impacted at the architecture and advanced digital system level impacts the ability of your game to properly operate. So the Atari used a 6502 uh, computer architecture, MOS technology CPU. Um, they, since it's only 8-bit, 
they had to use these design principles. They tried to have highest performance, and then good design requires good compromise. So this is the actual layout of the 40-pin DIP chip. And then, as you recall from previous lecture in section three, the ALU, you have the result, and then you have the overflow bit to indicate whether or not you have uh, overflow or underflow on an addition or subtraction problem. Now, in, the, in this actual architecture, the add and, add and subtract immediate operations uh, require two cycles for unsigned operations and three cycles for signed operations, because so it required an additional cycle to check for overflow or underflow. So the designer is like, well, we can improve our performance by three over two by just using unsigned integers as much as possible. So that's part of the game. As I mentioned, they had uh, tried to make it as historically accurate as possible. So they had this um, uh, thing called progressiveness. That was the actual variable in the class for each character. And so they wanted Gandhi to be the example of pacifism, lack of aggressiveness. So they had him as aggressiveness one. It's the lowest possible aggressiveness you can have. And they set that as an unsigned integer. So it was 8-bit. We have an 8-bit architecture. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, later in the game, as part of the game, if the country uh, became a democracy, the leader of that country had their aggressiveness decremented by two. So if your aggressiveness was 25, it became 23. If your aggressiveness was 100, it became 98. Now, if your aggressiveness is 1, it should become negative 1, right? 1 to 0 to negative 1. So it goes through the architecture just like we expected. It takes the 2's complement of 1, of, of, of 2, I'm sorry, of 2, and then adds them together, and you get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, right? However, when it's storing it back in the register, what's it saving it as? Unsigned. Unsigned. <laughs> so what is 255, right? So now Gandhi now has the highest possible aggressiveness in the game, which of course led to some hilarious situations, such as him saying, very well, we will mobilize our armies for war. You will pay for your foolish pride. And greetings from Gandhi, ruler of king of Indians. Our words are backed with nuclear weapons. <laughs> so even though their improvement in performance and addition and subtraction problems was performance over performance new, 3 over 2 equals 1.5. So they're like, oh, we're getting this improvement in performance. Unfortunately, it caused some hilariously bad results. <laughs> So as, as those of you, I mean, anybody who knows basic history knows Gandhi would not have condoned the use of war or nuclear weapons, but the video game did because of bad code computer architecture. You know, system attributes of a computer that contribute to its logical execution and are visible to the programmer. There you go, right there. This is where knowing this as engineers and knowing how that code matches pays off. So hopefully that was a little bit of a cheering up from getting your grades back on your exam. So this is why it's important to know that good design requires good compromise. is important, especially in the light of make the common case fast. Okay. So does anybody have any questions on the previous uh, lecture? The, uh, we covered instruction, fetch, instruction, decode, and the execution stages. Right? Does anybody have any questions on that so far? Oh, in those tables, the only thing I was wondering, the, uh, the V, you know, you have like the index. Oh, okay, index. right. What did the V stand for? V stands for valid bit. So the question okay. is about your uh, direct and set associative problems. So you have your tag, index, and memory, and also have this V. V stands for valid. The whole idea is that when you're going to, remember we had their example, we were going through um, the different levels of hierarchy, and you go to the memory based on determining the tag and the index. Well, first we go to the index to say, are you there? So instead of having to read the, uh, the tag to see if you're the specific mapping, the first thing you do is you just check the valid bit. If the valid bit is zero, that means there's nothing in the memory and there's no point in checking the tag. 
so you can improve your performance and just go immediately to the next level and, and higher end. So that is specifically what's known as a valid bit. Any other questions? Well, there's my, uh, there's only what there was uh, two levels or whatever, or? Set associated. Set associated. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm hoping you didn't put it for the PS and change the yet. Is that if, if I if that, if that was, if I didn't, it was an accident. I didn't okay. Know. Okay. Any other questions? When, when, on the exam, basically you're going to go through and figure out where everything is and fill out the internal and fill out the final table, and then you're just going to want to write yes. So on the test, when they were doing the, uh, the direct math cash, you don't have to like do every single one, one by one. No, no, you just, no, no. I, you'll do something like you'll, you'll, I'll, what I, you typically see is people will have their own little, very small, chart where they know everything should go, and they'll go, like, this replaces, this replaces, and they'll have, like, the little steps written out okay. on the side, and then they'll just write one table. That's that's how you conserve time <coughs> on that. Any other questions? Okay. So, bye-bye, warmongering Gandhi. Um, <laughs> and back to, back to peaceful Gandhi and data memory. Okay, so while Gandhi may be peaceful, maybe I'm not. Um, so data memory. So we had instruction fetch. We have obtained the instruction we're going to do. We go to instruction decode. We determine what this 32-bit value is at the physical level. We're sending things to the, um, the controller. We're sending things to the registers to determine which values in the registers we need. We're going to have the immediate value circumvent it, sign it, send it, so that we can come back to the ALU, right? Execution stage, we get the values from the registers. We get our values from the control signal, which are also sent to the ALU controller. It sends that value to the ALU, forms some sort of operation in the ALU, we get a result. We also have this value coming from register two. If we recall from load and store operations, the uh, way it works is RS is added with the immediate value, right? And that's our offset in memory. But then we have the second register, which indicates our actual value we're sending to it. So if we're doing a stored operation, we're calculating that address, and now we have the address, now we actually have to bring something in. Okay. So if we're going back to the house analogy, we go to different roads, we calculate which house on that specific road is, but then you're at a party, you actually need to bring some sort of you know dish. And that's what we're bringing from the register. At my house, at my house, the register, I made a turkey, and it's Thanksgiving, so now I go to the base address that's, you know, Murphy Road or whatever, and then I go down to 8120, and then I'm there, and then, okay, what do I have to do now? I've gotten to the location, I actually have to store the information. So we're going to talk about how that's done in the data memory stage. So in order to do this, we actually need three different control signals, memory read and memory write, are your control signals used to determine whether the information should be stored in data memory will be written to or read? So if memory is one, what does that mean? Right. If memory is one, are we reading from memory or writing to the memory? If memory is one, we're reading. If mem write is one, are we reading or writing? Right. Okay. Should memory and mem write ever be the same? No. no. Maybe. <laughs> no. But that doesn't mean they can't be the same. They just can't both be one, right? They could both be zero. Um, yeah. And when would they both be zero? No, if you're storing, you want it to be one because you want to write to the data memory. Right? If we're doing load word, we want it to be one because we're reading from the memory. But what type of instructions are we neither reading to the data memory or writing, uh, reading from the data memory or writing to the memory? What type of instructions are those? Branch is one. Jump, Jump is another. Yes. Register. Very good. That was the answer I've been looking for all along. Register instruction. Remember, you're taking value from two registers, performing an operation in the ALU, and then sending it back to the third local fast register, right? 
if it's an R type instruction, that means we are not going to be dealing with dead memory at all. We're going to circumvent it, and in the write back stage, we're going to use a control signal called memory to register, where it's one if it's coming from data memory, and zero if it is not. And so the other one is branch, that should be intuitive. That means that's one, they're going to branch, and zero if not. But here's the thing the branches are conditional, right? We actually have to use the. Uh, are you alright? Yeah. Okay. You kind of just went there first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next, they're, they're they do things. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> usually they keep your head up, not yeah. like that, unless you're on boring you can see or sleep. So, but here's the thing: they're conditional, right? So we have branch if equal, right? So we're generating a branch control signal saying we should branch, but we don't want to branch every single time, right? We only want to branch if equal, correct? So if I need to do something and something, meaning I want to branch and I need to know the condition, how would I take that value and determine whether or not I want to branch? I just dropped a massive hit in the question. If I wanted to, what's that? No, but that's a good guess. But branch is comparing the, is the multiplexer compare the PC plus four and the branch address. But if I want to determine just if I want to branch, I have a branch control signal. Branch is one. But let's say they're not equal, right? So I have a branch control signal, and the ALU tells me that they're not equal. Do I want to branch if it's branch equal? No. Branch not equal. Correct. So branch equal, and I have this other thing saying they're not equal, right? So how would I, what logic structure? Comparative. Not quite. If I want to compare, if I want to compare if it's branch signal and if I want to see if it's a equal, what type of logic structure would I use? If I want to see if I have a branch signal and, <laughs> there you go, <laughs> use an AND gate. So here's what, here's TGO 6.10. So here we have our sign extended value from the instruction, right? comes along, so this is 16 bits and it's been signed extended to 32 bits. Now we're going to use this control signal called ALU source, which we talked about last class. And RD1 and RD2, RD1 and RD2 are coming from the registers. So this ALU source control signal here is deciding between read data 2 and our sign extended immediate value. So if it's zero, that means we're going to use the value from the registers. Now it would be zero if it's an R-type instruction, or if it's a branch instruction. Why would it be zero if it's a branch instruction? What are we doing in what are we doing for branch instruction? Let me scroll up just a little bit so people in the back can see. What is a branch instruction physically doing? It's skipping, it's skipping a certain if what? It, 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 Correct. So the two values we're getting to compare, right, are have to come from the registers. So that means we're using RD1 and RD2 for branch. So if you're making a truth table, wait, hint. Um, we would want alien source to be zero if R type instruction, <laughs> then we're on R or a branch instruction. Now, what type of instructions would we use the signed immediate value to add with the R first uh, RS from RD1? Yes, Adam. Um, uh, I had a question. About yeah. Your, um, so when when you uh, like when you're doing the assembly language and mm -hmm. you have the dollar zero. Correct. To equal the dollars, see if it's equal to zero. Is that pulling that value from a register? Yeah, because if you recall from the MIPS great, uh, green sheet, we had the actual registers. The initial zero register actually just contains, in this case, 32 zeros. And it can never be added or subtracted to. So instead of having to use an immediate instruction where you're storing that, you can actually use the, the reason why you'd want to do a branch and compare it to zero is because the other 16 bits of that instruction are being used to calculate your branch address. 
So you'd use the first value, RD2 comes from register zero. Now you're using this for the ALU to make the comparison. In the same instruction, you would use the sign extended value, which comes up here, to shift left two, which we're multiplying by four because why? There, I, I've beaten it into George Humphrey, yeah. Byte addressing, right? If I'm shift left two, why class? Byte addressing, very good. So we byte address, right? We have PC plus four, and we're adding it here. So this is, when I was describing earlier, you have to have the current instruction, you have to add one, and then you have to add the number that you're coming off. If you looked at the answer keys, I said PC plus one plus the value. It's because you're multiplying the value by four, and you're adding it here. This PC plus four, if you recall from previously in the all the way back in instruction fetch stage, you take the value of the program counter, which is pointing to the current address, and then you're immediately adding four here, which is the same as adding one instruction in byte addressing. So we've already done that. So physically, that's why we have to do this. So you add with an ALU? No, we're at, we have a specific 8-bit adder. Okay. And we have a specific 8-bit adder. So our data, this data path will have two 8-bit adders and a full ALU. This is why I had to do an 8-bit ALU and then put it into the 8-bit adder and then put it into the ALU. Because in the data path, you'll require separate 8-bit adders. So instead of having to write a whole new AO adder here for that for your final project, you already have the pieces together. You just plop them in there and it's done. Is that PC plus 4? Okay. Yeah, PC plus 4. So then what we do is we take the PC plus 4, we have fan out here, and it's 0, meaning that if the result is 0, we're just going to be doing the next instruction. And if it's 1, we're going to be doing a branch, doing the branch. And the only way it's going to be, we have here, we have a 0 bit, because we're actually, this is representing branch on equal. So if it's 0, it's going to compare them. It's going to put a 1 out here. If we call from the ALU and I had the comparators, you put out a bit to indicate whether or not they're equal or not. That's why. Because now, you put this out here, you use an AND gate with your one bit branch control signal, and then it goes here. And then that multiplexer will make the decision as to whether or not which one you're using. So then, here's the second part of it. So the ALU has now calculated something. Right. So now we have another fan out. You see how this is going to circumvent the data memory? If the ALU is performing a load or store word operation, it's taking the base address from RD1, taking the offset from the 32-bit sign extended value, adding them, and then that calculates the actual address in data memory. Right. So then the write data, which means, going back to the analogy, we have now figured out the exact house we need to. Right data is what we're bringing to the party, right? That's coming from RD2. That's why we have this fan up here, and it goes to right data. The only time you would need this is for store word instruction, because you're taking something from a register and storing it to the data bank. And then we have our control signal ALU source, we have sign extension, then read and then write. And then the right back stage will be comparing these two values. Does anybody have any questions on this so far? Okay. So la the last stage is right back. So for jump instructions, we're taking that 25 to 0. We're shift left. By two, because what class? Byte addressing. Very good. So if we have byte addressing, now if we have 25 to 0, then this is 26 bits. We shift left by 2, so now we have 28 bits. But we need a 32-bit address, correct? So we have to account for these other four bits. So what it's going to do in the MIPS architecture is it's going to take the four most significant bits from the PC plus 4 and concatenate them to the front of the jump address. 
So concatenate means it just copies the four most significant bits and just puts it there. So the symbol will be just a circle with a line up and down. That's concatenation in hardware. Now the jump control signal should be pretty straightforward. A control signal is used to determine if it's you jump, one if you jump, zero if you don't. And again, you're going to be comparing the result. You're going to get that value from the MUX that's coming from whether or not you use PC plus 4 or branch. And then you're going to go to a different multiplexer. And it's going to say whether or not you have your jump address that you've calculated or the PC plus 4 or branch. If it's 0, you're going to use PC plus 4. 1, you're going to use the jump address. And then that's what comes back to your program counter to be turned to determine the next instruction. So the other aspect is, if you go back here, we have this result from the ALU and this read data coming from data memory, right? So we have to choose which one is going to go back to the right register back in the register stage, correct? So we're going to use a control signal called memory to register, mem to reg, a lot of people write M2R, like the number 2R. So this determines whether or not you're going to write from the memory to the register or not. If it, the value is 1, that means you're writing from data memory and putting that into the register. So what type, what's the specific type of instruction that mem to reg would be 1? If I'm writing from the memory to the register, what's, what's the instruction type? Load word, correct. And if it's 0, what type of instruction is it? That means I'm taking a value from the ALU and storing it in the register. So, no, not store word. Store word is putting in data memory. So I'm taking something from the ALU and I'm putting it into the register. What type of instruction is that? What's that? Yes, exactly right. Register type, because you're storing it into a register. Also, add immediates, right? Because at immediate, you're taking anything you're taking from the ALU and putting it back into a register instead of data memory, because we're taking of the principle of what? Think, what's that? It's on your exam. Locality, right? So memory to register. If it's zero, just fast registers. So this is our this is the truth table from the textbook. So our format, so register destination means we're comparing which, whether or not we're going to use the 20 to 16 or 15 to 11 from the instruction fetch, right? Going to the instruction decode state. If it's 1, that means we're going to be using 15 to 11. And if it's 0, we're going to be using 20 to 16. So for our format, we're going to be using 15 to 11, so it's 1. For loaded word, register destination is going to be 0 because we're going to be using 20 to 16. So why are store word and branch equivalent? These are X's. It means they're don't cares. Why don't I care what the value of register destination is in this case? Remember, register destination is determining which value we're going to be writing to a register, correct? Storeword's exactly right. Storeword's going to data memory. What about branch? Am I updating? Am I updating uh, the registers for branch instruction? Anyone? No. Branch? Do I update the registers for branch instruction? I'm doing a comparison, and I'm using that to go to a different at instruction address, correct? So I'm doing a comparison, going to a different instruction address. Am I updating the registers at all? So I'm not going to be writing to the registers. That's what register destination is. So here's the thing. How do we ensure that we don't have to care about that? If we look in the fourth column here, it has register write or reg write, control signal, right? That means for arc type and load word, it's going to be 1. And then for store word and branch equivalent, it's going to be 0. That means it's preventing it from writing to any of the registers, no matter what the instruction is. So I can send it anywhere I want, 
going back to our house analogy, if we're just doing register, I can come and knock on the door. If you have it locked and you have a guard, I can't get in, right? That's what this register write is doing. One, come on in and write the new data. Zero, stay out. I'm keeping the same data. Therefore, I can do these don't cares for her store word and branch equivalent. And additionally, it's the same thing. I don't have to care about memory to register. Because I don't care what's coming from the ALU. I don't care what's coming from data memory. You can choose whatever you want. You're not getting in my house, right? Because register write is zero, zero. Now, ALU source, ALU source, remember zero comes from that the ALU search control signal is controlling that multiplexer from read data to or the sign extended third uh, immediate value, right? So we're determining whether or not we're going to be adding or doing something in the ALU from either the registers or the immediate value. If it's zero, it comes from the registers. If it's one, it comes from the immediate value, right? So here, it's our format, since it comes from the registers, it's zero. Branch equivalent, they both have to come from the registers, right? As Adam said earlier, zero. Loaded and stored word, we're taking that base pointer from read, read data one and adding the offset, which comes from the immediate value. So there was going to be one for that control signal. We've already discussed memory to register and register write. Mem read and mem write. One if you read, zero if you write, or load word. For mem read and mem write, store word, zero if you were not reading from it, and one for writing to it. And zero is zero for branch equivalent, and zero, zero for mem read and mem write. Now, here's a question. Why are these values not don't cares? Here we are able to say, I don't care, I don't care. They don't match. Why do I, remember here, we only have to, for the registers, we only have to have regs write, but we don't have regs read control signal, correct? That is correct, but why do I have to have a specific control signal for the data member? What's physically happening? Now, this is where computer architecture and computer organization are different. Right? What type of memory is being used in the registers? Dual read, single write, what? What type of random access memory is this? Yes, say that louder. SRAM. So SRAM, you only need, it's going to, SRAM is more, um, is more not volatile, but actually hold it longer. What type of memory is in the data memory? What type of random access memory is in data memory? DRAM. Now DRAM has to be constantly refreshed every clock cycle in order to be able to hold its value. So you have to have a control signal to indicate I'm not reading or writing. I'm, the zero is a uh, negative edge refresh trigger in that data memory. So that's why they have to have a memory and mem write for data memory, but no mem, uh, reg, mem, uh, reg read. Does that make sense? So branch, three seems pretty straightforward. One, you branch zero if you don't, and then ALU will generate the value we're going to use to AND. And now ALU op, we're going to be going into what's going into the uh, ALU controller in a little bit here. But we have, if it's R type, it's zero, one zero for, remember it's a two bit value that comes from the controller and goes to the ALU control, right? So it's, if it's R type, it's one and zero. If it's a branch, it's a zero and a one. And otherwise, it's going to be zero, zero. So we're getting these, it says two bit ALU op control signal. Plus, what, what's the other input to the ALU controller? Function. Exactly right, the six bit function. So the reason why we have 0, 0, and 0, 1 for these ITEP instructions is because that 6-bit value at the end of any instruction is an R-type, it's a function. If it's an I-type or a J-type, it's just the last 6 bits of the stored value, right, in the immediate addressing. 
So we need to have these specific control signals to say we don't actually care about those six bits. We just want to care about the 0, 0, or 0, 1. So this is the entire MIPS data path. Will I expect you to reproduce it on the exam? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Guess who else is reproducing it on their exam? Everybody you're competing with for jobs. Uh, I want to be an electrical engineer, but I don't have to do the work to do it. <laughs> All right, so let's go over this whole thing while you guys are write, draw, writing it out. Program counter goes to instruction memory. Split off, the adder does PC plus four here. So this is the instruction fetch stage. Instruction decode, 31 to 26 goes to the control unit. You put 25 to zero over, we shift left by two, becomes 28 bits. We've added this PC plus four, so now we can just concatenate. That's what this symbol means. So 31 to 28, 31 to 30, 29, 28, four most significant bits become the four most significant bits of the jump instruction. So this is now the physical jump value. And we'll ignore that for the time being because I want to explain here. This multiplexer here, zero or one, the control signal is register destination. We decide between 20 and 16 for WR, which is write register. 25 to 21 goes to read reg 1. 20 to 16 goes to read reg 2. We have the first, this next control signal, register write, which determines whether or not we write to the register. And we have register destination to choose between 20 and 16. This value goes to 5, this is 15 to 0. That's the immediate value. We split it off, we have the 5 to 0 here, that's our function in the event of an R-type instruction. That goes to our ALU controller here. The 15 0 also is sign extended by 32 bits and is put out here. We also have the 10 to 6 value for our shift amount, which is sent straight to the arithmetic logic unit, which you would use this value to determine in your one hot encoding how many bits you're going to shift, right? So, we have now covered instruction decode. The execution stage, read data 1 always goes to the arithmetic logic unit. Read data 2, either you get the result from ALU source or the sign extended immediate value going into this multiplexer here for the ALU. We also fan out here. Now this is the sign extended immediate value. We shift left by two for branch addressing, for byte addressing. We add this value plus, this is, comes from PC plus four, and we send it to the multiplexer here. The zero bit from the ALU is added with the branch control signal to determine whether or not we're gonna branch. Additionally, we have the jump instruction. If it's one, we're going to jump. So it's coming from the shift left two, the concatenation here. If it's zero, you have the PC plus four. So in order for it to just go to the next instruction, jump is going to be zero, branch is going to be zero, and then it just comes all the way back around and tells me what the next instruction is going to be. The ALU produces a result, and it circumvents data memory after fan out, or it goes to the address in data memory. Because here, we're doing a load word restored operation. The base address comes from read data one, goes to the ALU. The offset comes from the immediate value, the sign extended, ALU source is one, and then they're added. So now we have our base address plus our offset. And now, it tells me where to go. To get that actual value in the event of a store word operation, we go to read data 2. It comes here, circumvents the arithmetic logic unit, and goes straight to the data memory, correct? 
So in the case of a load word instruction, we have mem read and mem write. It's load word. We're going to mem read one, mem write zero, and then comes down out of data memory. We then have this controller, this multiplexer, from the control signal, mem to reg. If it's zero, it's coming from the ALU to the register. If it's one, it's going from the memory to register, hence mem to reg. And then it comes back here, and then goes to write data in the register. Do you have a so question? The, oh. uh, the, the word below read is the adder. Uh, Where? Left here, you were right on it. Yeah. Read address, ADDR. ADDR, <coughs> right, that's the same thing, ADDR over here in data. Yes, Tom. The, uh, the memory read, yeah. when that's one, mm -hmm. it'll go. Yeah, memory. It'll memory. go into the. Uh, Data memory mm -hmm. right there at the address, right? Yes. If it's zero, then we're not going to go into the data memory, but just go straight to the multiplexer. You're talking about if we're reading. Okay, so let's say we have. Are you talking about load word instruction or an R type instruction? Uh, okay, let's load do, word. Let's do both. Okay. Load word. Load word. What, in the load word instruction, what's going to happen is we decode our instruction and go to the controller. First thing it does is say, do we want to reg write? It's going to be one. Register destination, I want to write to the value of 20 to 16. So that means register destination is going to be 1, which is going to be 0. And since we have 1 here, what's going to happen is RD1 is going to come up here. right? And then we have our offset, time extended, is added, so ALU source becomes 1. And then they're added together to generate the address. Now. This means since the load word instruction, we're going to mem read is 1, mem write is 0. That means since it's mem read, we're actually going to have a value output here. Now we have to make a comparison because the oh. base address is also coming over here, right? Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is I need to choose between these two values. And so what's going to happen is mem to reg is also going to be 1. Because I don't want this value, I want us to take the value from the data memory and then physically put it back in the register. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions about this? So the yeah. five types of memory cards that you saw in the text are pretty much all of them incorporated. With all of them are. So let's talk about that. Register, right? Where's the, where's the register addressing? Here. Immediate addressing. Immediate value. Okay. I can determine the. That actually, that actually goes to the ALU. PC relative addressing. PC relative means we have a program counter, and then it's added from the immediate value, right? So that means it's relative to the program counter. Pseudo direct is jump addressing, right? That means 26 is 0. Side shift left 2, so we have byte addressing. Now, the reason it's called pseudo direct is because it's still only 28 bits here. We have to concatenate the four most significant bits. Right? That's why it's called pseudo addressing. And then we go through data memory right, by calculating this value here and then storing it back in the register. So that's all five of them right here. Does anybody have any other questions? All right. So this is the combinational logic that goes on inside the ALU controller, right? So 
We have our six bits coming in from the six most significant bits of all the instructions. So it's op 5 through op 0. And then we have R type, add I, load word, store word, branch equivalent, branch not equal, and jump. Now, if you go to the op codes in your MIPS green sheet, I can tell you right now just by looking at this what they are. R type is 0 hex, add I is 0 8 hex, load word is 2 3, store word is uh, 2. ABC, branch equivalent is 404, four. branch on equal is 05, and jump is 02 hex. And the reason I can tell this is because the not inputs to the AND gates actually, if you do it as, if you look at it as zeros and ones, it actually matches. 0000, zero, 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 zero. it's a not. 001000. Zero, 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 zero. So if you can look at your MEP screen sheet, do that, and then that just becomes drawing it out, right? So here we have our register destination. This is where the don't cares come into play. If I don't care, I'm not going to hook it up. That reduces design size. So register destination is a one only if it's an R type instruction, right? So if it's an R type, when we get this particular combination, it'll be one, otherwise it'll be zero. ALU source, it's going to be one if it comes from an add immediate, because we're adding the immediate portion of the instruction, or a load word or store word, because we're calculating the offset, right? The base address. So it's going to be either add immediate, or load word, or store word. And then we have the or gate, or gate. Value source. Otherwise, it would be zero. For memory to register, I'm only using that as a load word. Because the only thing I'm going to be taking from data memory and storing to the registers is a load word instruction. And if you recall from earlier in section one, I talked about having the data and registers being separate to improve performance. This is another benefit. Instead of having to have a number of different instructions, we're able to use this one instruction to reduce the size of our control unit. Register write, we're going to be writing to the registers if it's an R type instruction, if it's a load word instruction, or add immediate. All of them. Correct? All of them. All of them, yes. <laughs> right. So, R type, load word, and Add immediate. Correct? Branch equivalent comes from BEQ. Branch not equal comes from BNE. Pretty straightforward. Memory, load word only. Now write the store word only. LU op one, that's going to be a one, zero. If it's an R type instruction, or if I require some sort of addition. So, R type or add I. Can we off zero? I need that to be a one only if it's some sort of branch instruction. So it can be branch equal or branch not equal. And then last two are on these jump, just comes from jump. So I ask you guys a thought question here. We go back to the previous data path. In this previous topical, uh, uh, in this previous drawing of the data path, we have a zero bit indicating branch on equal, right? So if we change this to BEQ and I wanted to change the instruction, the data path to account for BNE as well, how would I do that? If the zero bit, if the zero bit is one when the two values are going are equal, what does that mean for when it's not equal? What's the value going to be? Zero. zero. So I can have that come out here, and then I want to have a branch not equal control signal. 
So if I want to have this and this, what type of logic structure would I use? AND gate. You guys are catching on. All right, where's my chalk? All right, so I now have coming from we'll call this zero bit and it would be Q, right? And so if if I want this to be one, these inputs to be one, right? To trigger it. And then I have another AND gate over here. We call this BNE. And I want this to be one and zero, right? Just like before I showed you the trick. Just hook this up here, invert the input. So if it's zero, that means this will turn into a one. And that's how we determine the condition. So then we have our output here. What's that output going to control? If this output is controlling a multiplexer, what is the other output going to control? A multiplexer. And so what are my two inputs of my uh, multiplexer going to be? Come on, engineering aspirants. Engineer. One zero or zero one, one zero. right? We have a, this value coming out, right? And then what's the other value I'm going to want in there? So if it's going to be zero, if it's if it's going to be branch not equal, that means this BEQ is going to be zero, so it's going to pass the PC plus four, right? Mm -hmm. But if I BNE, I'm still going to want a branch, right? So where am I? Where do I want a branch to? What's what's the Now, if, I have P, if it's zero, then I'm going to have a PC value coming out here, right? So, if I have the PC and I have to decide between the branch address, how am I going to do that? If I want to go to one house or the other house, how do I decide? Address. Address, right? Very good. So, you just span out the address, use another multiplexer. And use that. And so, what I've done here is I've done some VHDL that actually implements your controller. And I limited myself to using only, so I have AND gates and OR gates, right? And then for this specific one, I would re reduce one of R type, add I, load word, and store word. And then I actually used, so here I've added the six op codes that I'm expecting you to be able to do. And then I have these values, so not, 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 it's all zeros, matches R type. And then I cascade them through two input AND gates. Add I, the same thing except the difference is for add I, instead of using the not, I just used one of the watt input wires because there's only one bit difference here between zero and R type and add I, correct? We go back up here, we'll see that the difference in bit is only one here. And then I did the same thing for load word opcode, and I did the same thing for store word. And then I used OR bits to determine which ones I want to do for register write. And I did OR for register destination. I did, oh, so register destination, I did a 10 nanosecond delay because each OR gate is 5 nanosecond, right? So I wanted them all come out at the same time. And then mem read and mem write, I also had a 10 nanosecond delay. So this is the simulation result because I only had load word, register destination, mem read, and mem write control signals. And these are my inputs, so 0, 0, 0 with a delay gave me an art type of 1 and mem read. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, it's add immediate. Register destination is going to be 0 every time. And then 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, I want to mem read, mem write. 
And now, as a hint, when you're designing this for your final project, this is the actual screen capture that you're going to want. This is the actual value. So when you're writing it, you can go back to this lecture and take a look and see what it's supposed to be. We have the two-bit LU up, one zero 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 one zero zero, and this is the this will match your truth table. So if you also remember, did I add a nor? Oh, we can we can fix that really quick out here actually. So if you recall from section three, we had the topical guide objective where it had else control signal. We have a two-bit ALU op and the six-bit uh, function value coming in, and we have these desired values, right? So we want a four-bit ALU control signal to come from ALU control to go to the ALU, right? So we go back to our data path, you can see that this value here is four bits, and this value here is two bits. So here's how we determine that. And, or, and, sub, set less than, nor, add i, load word, store word, branch equivalent, branch not equal, and jump. Recall that all R type instructions are one zero, and they require functions. Add me is going to be zero zero. Load words going to be zero 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 one zero one. These are all don't care. And then these ALU control signals are meant to map 30. Okay, so our function from add is two zero hex. So that's going to be mapped with this to produce an ALU control zero 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 one zero, which matches our topical guide objective from section three. Or it's going to be one zero. So it's two five hex. Two five hex. 0, 0, 0, 0001. If we look up here, 0, 0, 0, 0001. And it's going to be 1, 0. Function is going to be 2, 4 hex. Subtract is 2, 2 hex. Set less than is 2, A hex. Hmm? And. When I left it blank, we could actually use our MIP screen sheet to determine what the NOR should be. So NOR, our 0 is our function. It's going to be 1, 0 for op. And NOR is going to be 2, 7 hex. So the blank values are going to be 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then 2, 7 hex. We can derive from the next screen sheet. And those are the values that's going into the ALU for NOR, and our output is going to be 1100. Zero, zero. And these four bits are going into your ALU to control your 16 to 1 multiplexers that you're going to be used to control the 8 bits. Right? Because you're going to have 16 possible instructions. This is why I wanted you to keep this 16 bits, because this is where we ended up. So let's do annotation here. Comment, there we go. That's more like it. Okay. And that becomes two seven hex. And we can make the font. While you guys are writing that down, I'll make the font match. Courier new. Ten. There.
Good. Does anybody have any questions on this? Thomas is trying to speak for everybody. That was um, that function the hex EQ the two A H. How was that two A H? Yeah, two A H. A is the second four of uh, four bits of the of the function amount. Should it be uh, for the should it be one zero? Should it be one zero one zero? That's yeah, yeah, yeah that's correct. Yeah. Hey, look, I can fix things. Yeah, it's all backwards. Oh, that's not going to work. One zero one zero. Hey, any other questions? Is it? They ask you a question. Why are all jump all don't care, but then still produces an AOE control? Because it's, what's going to happen is it's going to match 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So it's going to produce an AOE control, but it doesn't matter because the jump control signal is going to jump, meaning it's going to, we don't care what the AOE is going to happen, but it's still going to produce a value. Just like when we looked at our diagram for the, for the regular controller, it's still going to, it's going to produce a value every time. Same thing with uh, load work, let's say we have a store word operation, right? Store word operation is going to calculate the result, but we still need to have the fan now to account for our type possibility. So then we need the control signal to say, actually, I don't want that value. So what's happening is that the data path is constantly doing things to account for every possible situation, and then the controller tells you which situations you actually want. Okay. So the last thing we're going to do is I want to go over one of these. I have four examples listed here. Um, and we're going to spend the next class going into the other uh, three examples. Can you even see that? Yeah, I should be able to see that. All right, where's uh, the light thing? No, wow, that didn't do any better. What's that? That is volume. <laughs> Not at all. All right. So explain what's going on here. So here's a type of problem you would actually see on an exam. I'll call it the reduced MIPS data path. So the example is draw a MIPS single cycle data path that implements R type instructions only. On an exam, I'd expect I would give you two add load word, add immediate store word, add branch, so those kind of combinations, right? So here, I've broken down just the pieces that you would need for an R-type instruction. So I'm going to show you what this actually uh, says, and hopefully you'll see it better on the uh, video. Yeah, you should be able to see it better on the video because I can read it. So you have your program counter here, and then you have PC plus 4. Since it's an R-type instruction only, we don't have to worry about branch or jump, right? Mm -hmm. So what this is this is happening here is the it's just going right back to the program counter. We have an instruction memory. We need on every instruction, and then actually I can probably just draw it if I'm an eraser. Here we go. I'm drawing for you. So here's what it looks like. We have PC. 
This goes to the add becomes four plus, and it just comes right back around, right? So that's our PC. Goes to the address, ADDR, and then instruction memory, and it produces a 32 bit output, right? Going to go 31 to 26 goes to the control. 25 to 21 goes to read reg 1. 20 to 16 goes to read reg 2. And this is where things are common for every type of instruction, right? Now, what you can't see due to the light is for an R type instruction, we have read register, correct? Now, in a full data path, you would have to make the decision between whether you're doing an R type or an I type instruction using register destination. However, since there is no I type instruction, you're going to make it 15 to 11. Drop a multiplexer, reduce data path. Does that make sense? Now, draw the registers. And then, you, since we're going to be writing to it, we're going to need the control signal reg write. So we don't need the IU destination. We don't need the source. So I'm giving a preview here. Do we need 15 to 0? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Shift left logical is an R type instruction. We do need 5 to 0. That's dismiss you guys in a couple minutes. Okay, three minutes left. All right, so this 5 to 0 is going to go to your ALU control, right? And we have a 2 bit ALU op, right? In there. This is also going to have your 4-bit output that goes to the ALU. Read data 1, already 1 here, is going to go to the ALU. Correct? Now, normally we would have an immediate value to have to decide for ALU source, right? <laughs> but we're not going to need that because there's no immediate value, so that just goes straight there. 10 to 6 also goes to the ALU. And then this value also comes in. Now, do we update or do we read to or write from data memory at all in an R type instruction? You had shaking no, they were correct. So we wouldn't even worry about it. So it just goes back to write data. So this is a simple, simple version. We're going to spend next class doing three more examples of this. Is it 15 to 9? 15 to 11. 15 to 11. Oh, okay. Correct. So I, it's going to load word? Or no, it's going to write register. Write register. The last one is write data. So your homework will be 6.8 through 6.16. An example 6.1. 16. Ah, 16. Hey, you are dismissed. <laughs>